it's my great pleasure to introduce Jimmy, and he will talk about the index pairing and the quantitative control of scalar curvature. Yeah, please. Thank you. Thank you for your introduction, Gordon, and thank for the organizer for giving the talk, giving the opportunity to, to talk here. So here's the title, and I wanted to talk about the relation between index pairing and scalar curvature. So uh, I, I'll, I'll probably give a uh, more general uh, and talk for more general audience. So if you have any questions, feel free to interrupt me. Okay, so here's the outline of my talk. So first I will give a short introduction to positive scalar curvature. And in particular, I will talk about a uh, famous result that no positive scalar curvature on the end torus. And the next, I will move to the main part for the quantitative control of scalar curvature, and then some application of the result. Okay, so scalar curvature is a quite classical geometric concept. And well, the usually the easiest way to introduce to everyone here is by the following for the entire expansion. So if we are working on remaining manifold, a scalar curvature. Well, it's a function, okay, it's a number defined every point, which from the Taylor expansion. So uh, scalar, so scalar curvature is positive means the ball is smaller near the point than the, compared to the Euclidean ball. Okay, so as you can see, scalar curvature really come from the comparison volume, but actually, I don't think anyone really use this definition as uh, part of the proof of other theorems. So, so in general, it can come from the like, phase of the curvature tensor. Okay, here's some example. So if the x is two-dimensional, then well up to a constant, the scalar curvature is simply the Gaussian curvature. So the hyperbolic space have negative scalar curvature, flat have zero, and sphere have positive scalar curvature. And more generally, if we are looking on the n sphere, then the scalar curvature is also positive. Uh, which is actually a constant n times n minus one. So uh, this can be think of, thought about that like standard constant for positive scalar curvature. Okay, so for uh, scalar curvature, a classic question is that does, is there exists a positive scalar curvature metric on given say closed manifold? Because it can it can be proved that for negative scalar curvature there are, there are actually no obstruction. For such problem, there are basically two different approaches. One is from the geometric analysis side using the so-called minimal hypersurface, and another is from the index series side using Dirac operators. So let me give a quick introduction of Dirac operators. So let me look at our, let's look at R2. So we, the, the motivation for Dirac operator is to find a first order differential operator whose square is equal to the Laplacian which is, uh, here I mean Laplacian by the positive Laplacian, okay. And um, actually Laplacian can be defined as functions, but actually this Dirac, we cannot find a fun, uh, an first order oper operator of functions whose square is Laplacian. But if we move to one dimensional higher and we can find a matrix, uh, matrix valid operator. So here, this is exactly the Dirac operator, the DDX times this matrix and DDY times this one. So if I call it this C1 and C2, it's a very elementary linear algebra verification that C1 square is C2 square is negative one, and C1, C2 plus C2, C1 is equal to zero. So if you square it, and DDX will give you uh, DDX square and the negative sign from C1 square, and similarly is DY, DY square. And because DDX and DDY commutes, we'll get the cross sum vanish. Okay, and the C1 and C2 are constructed even more general for uh, what is called the Clifford algebras. So this is an example in R2. And in general, if we're working on the manifold, so there's a slightly uh, topological obstruction of the existence of such C1, C2, and so on, uh, which is called spin. Oh, well, I, I'm, I'm not really uh, willing to talk too much on the concept of spin or just like you as it's a concept and it's purely topological uh, related to this uh, stiffer weighted class. And if, if I'm a spin manifold, then we can always find such kind of first order elliptic differential operator, we call D, the Dirac acting on the spinner bundle of M. 
it's not a function, but a vector bundle. And moreover, a square is actually not exactly Laplacian because here we use the fact that ddy and ddx commute, but for manifold, they may not commute. And actually the commutator of ddy and ddx is exactly the definition of curvature. So here we will also have a curvature term, which turns out to be scalar curvature over four. So uh, as a function. Okay, so uh, here's a formula called the Lichinois formula for Dirac operator. In particular, if scalar curvature is po strictly positive, then we know that D is invertible. So that's the relation between uh, index theory and scalar curvature. So uh, this is summarized to be the following theorem. If the scalar curvature is positive, then D is the invertible for, from the Lichinois formula. But for an explicit elliptic differential operator, we know it's Fred Home, and its index can be computed from the Atia Singer index theorem. And in this case, the index of D is equal to the so called E hygienic. So then we come to the uh, following theorem, which is one of my favorite theorems because it's easy, but it shows a deep relation between geometry and that. Seeing that if M is a closed spin manifold, here we assume spin with non zero A hygienic then there's no PS3 P positive scalar curvature metric on M. The proof is exactly here because uh, the index is, cannot be zero. So this theorem al al already covers a large class of manifolds, say for example, the A-dimensional Bosch manifold, uh, but, but there's still some examples that the theorem cannot cover. So here's one of those, the torus. The n torus, well, we know that n torus is flat, or it can be made flat. So almost every characteristic class you can think about is zero, including the a genus. So one cannot use the uh, Lichnos Venus theorem in the last slide uh, directly to tell the result of existence of positive scalar curvature or not. But actually, the, there's a theorem, well, originally it's a, it's a conjecture called Girard conjecture, and it states that there's no metric on torus with positive scalar curvature. And now it's proved by Xuan Yao in 1979 using minimal hypersurface method. Uh, but here there's a dimension restriction because it might have singularity on higher dimension. And from the index theory part, we have the theorem from gorman lawson pro proving that there's no positive scalar curvature metric on torus using drug operator. The method of gromov lawson uh, is basically the in, use the index pairing and what is called what they call enlargeability of torus. Okay, and here I would like to show you a explicit proof for this theorem followed by the spirit of gromov lawson Okay, uh, without loss of generality, we assume that it's even. Well, that's just technical. And let D be the Dirac operator acting on spin bound of torus. Well, torus is spin, okay? It's it, because it's flat, everything's zero, okay? So we assume by contradiction that there's a positive scalar curvature metric. So we know that D has a special gap because D is greater than or equal to scalar curvature over four. Uh, D square is greater than scalar curvature over four, so D is greater than, well, I have got the absolute value. It's greater than square root of it over two. Okay, uh, but when from the Atia Singer index theory, we know that D is a Fred Home operator, but it's unbounded. But we are usually more feel better to work with bounded Fred Home operator. And there's a canonical way to uh, to, to to move what to transform this operator into a bounded Fred Home operator by the functional calculus. So here we choose a so-called normalizing function. Uh, let me draw a picture for you. So this is a positive one, and this is a negative one. This is the function chi. So normal as a function called normalized function, if it's an odd function, and it's a one at infinity and negative one at negative infinity. And furthermore, we assume that it is derivative is Schwartz, so that we can take its function for your analytic for your transform. 
And furthermore, we require that the first transform of its derivative is compactly supported. Or you can say the distribution of the transform of chi itself is compactly supported. Okay. So if we apply the functional calculus of this chi to the D, we get a bounded right home operator whose index is the same as D. Okay, now we, we, we write D as a, okay, I hear I, I probably cheated a little bit. So actually when we say the index of D is not the index of the whole operator because self John is next to zero, we are saying the index of this part with respect to a Z2 reading on the spinner bundle. Okay, but, uh, okay. And with that assumption, so we can write D with the Z2 gradient, we write D as off diagonal operator. And then chi of D because chi is odd. So it's also off diagonal and we can call it the U, D and V, D. And because D has a special gap. So, so which means the picture, D doesn't have spectrum inside here. So if so, which means chi is very close to plus minus one. In other words, chi squared minus one is very close to one. So in particular, we have this formula: U V minus one is just chi squared minus one, which have a upper bound, just uh, the error here. Yeah, where the this bound is given by square root of sigma over two. Okay, so now this is just an index area of D itself. But this is actually not the index we're talking about, or we're going to talk about. What we really care is index pairing. So for the classical idea of Atia, D can be thought of to be a um, k homology class, and which can be paired with k theory. So for, uh, for k theory class, okay, we're, we're working on even dimensional, so we just pick a projection. Or more, or, Okay, maybe I should say a matrix value of the projection, but okay, let me change a little bit, just say projection. Okay, and um, then the index pairing of, so this is a key homology. And this is the key theory. And the pairing is a number, which is uh, actually, it's a very explicit defined. It's just index of P times U times P where U is in the last page here. Or in other words, we're talking about the index of D plus, so they're just the same thing. Okay, but here's the interesting thing. The, the, we know that the commutator, of, the commutator of D and P, because D is a differential operator, it's um, actually a bounded operator by the Lipschitz constant of P, by the chain roots. So if you move to the functional calculus, it also is a bound, it's also a bounded operator, bounded by P chi. Recall that P chi is a supporter of the Fourier transform and Lipschitz constant of P. Here, I mean, LIP means uh, P, Lipschitz constant of P is, think about P as a, if P is a Lipschitz function. So if we look at P U D P, and it has a, like say almost a inverse, P V D P and we can move one P from here to here and we get, get a commutator, which is bounded by this above. And now we U V are, get, are, are uh, touched each other. So from the previous, the estimate on the previous page, we, this follows from like U V minus one. Okay, so any questions so far? Okay, so now it's just an interesting thing. So first we can pick a chi such that this guy is small, say it's smaller than one half. But now chi is fixed, so p chi is also fixed. And the interesting for Taurus is that we can make this lip as small as possible. And while the index pairing is not zero. And the electric constant can be made arbitrarily small. So first, let, let, let me let me divide this into two parts. First, pick a p the index is non-zero. That's all. Th this is always possible because d is your, uh, called the fundamental class of a manifold or a generator of the Q module. 
And for example, uh, if you're familiar with uh, Riemann surface of TN2, and that P can be chosen to be the canonical line bundle uh, over torus, so that the pairing follows from the uh, Riemann Roch theorem, which is non zero. But sorry, this P is a projection, but the matrix value. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I, here I, I forgot to say as yeah, matrix value. Maybe mm. M sub K over, over this. Mm. But the formula is still the, the same, and the estimate is still the same. and independent mm -hmm. of the kind. Yeah, thank you for pointing out. Right, uh, okay, but non-zero is okay, but how, how do we make it small? It actually follows from the, the covering map. There's a state info covering from the torus to torus. Just think about like a uh, rescaling on Euclidean. What can always lift the metric, uh, like this info covering, one can always lift the metric, metric from the torus to a larger torus uh, so that the scalar curvature is still positive, greater than sigma, but the projection are made flat more and more. Uh, the projection, we can use the same projection on the larger torus so that it's very flat. So we can, so that's a, that's a key point. The projection, the Lipschitz constant P can be made arbitrarily small, or in other words, it can be made arbitrarily flat because the torus, the higher torus can be made larger and larger. So by picking this guy to be small, we also have this smaller than one half. Now, altogether, we'll give you smaller than one, which means this guy is the invertible. So, so think about P as identity operator, which contradicts the fact that the pairing is non-zero. So this is basically the proof of the Grash theorem, no PIC on torus. And this kind of fact is called uh, enlargeability. Back one more. Okay, so, so actually, but this is a special case for Carl but we can generalize our discussion a little bit further. So this process basically means if we, if we know that scalar curvature is sigma, and by taking a functional function chi, the Lipschitz constant cannot be very small. And the lower bound is given by sigma. So we can summarize this by the following theorem. If we're working on a close even dimensional spin manifold with scalar curvature positive, then if we have a projection in k zero, such that the pairing is non-zero, then the Lipschitz constant cannot be very small. Oh, in other words, the scalar curvature cannot be very large. Well, that's basically the same thing. Yeah, uh, and the proof is just basically the same process. If it's so small, then the index pairing is zero. And where the constant C is actually universal. Uh, it doesn't depend on the geometry of the manifold. It only depends on the constant we use, like the one half and the normalizing function chi. So I, I want to mention that, uh, or, or, or say in, in other words, if you are working on manifold already have positive scalar curvature, and but of course we can find a, a, a projection that pairs with non -zero, with non-zero pairing with it. So this Lipschitz P can be chosen to be the Lipschitz of the given projection, but scalar curvature cannot be too large. Or in other words, if you fix the scalar curvature lower bound, we cannot make it as flat as possible. So in particular, when X is equal to the unit sphere, um, this can be thought of to be another version of the theorem from LaRue, saying that if you work on the sphere and you want a new metric, which is greater than the original metric, this is the original standard metric, standard, standard scale curvature in the original standard metric. Uh, which I call it G zero. Okay. Then if, we, if such thing happen, then G cannot be very large compared to G zero. Where we can think about if G is arbitrarily large, then the same projection is very flat with respect to G. This will contradict to our theorem. But actually our theorem cannot tell us this exactly what, but LaRousse result can tell us, okay, Really, the concept is one. 
Okay, but, okay, but here is an interesting question. So since we, we are still away from one, but what kind of constant can we do? So what is the best constant of that C here? So C is actually universal, but it depends on, well, blah, blah, the constant here, and also depends on the normalizing function we choose. And so, so asking the question for best C is, asking to, is to ask the best normalizing function. Okay, so let me uh, summarize this, but let me forget all the geometry, but only look at the no normalizing function. Now we fix two small numbers called epsilon one, epsilon two. And chi is a normalizing function of say, this shape. This is a negative one and one, okay? And we have two numbers of the normalizing functions. First, I call it p chi, which I just mentioned some, some pages ago, and the which means the support of, well, uh, I can just say it's a part of chi itself because the, I mean the distribution of Fourier transform is complex support in negative p chi to p chi. So I, I use p because some this sometimes this kind of number is usually called the propagation. And I use s chi to denote the following number. If x is greater than s, the s chi the number, then chi, the value of the function evaluated as x, is very close to one up to the two small errors. So if you go back to the geometry setting, this number is basically the square root of scalar curvature over two. When we say x is greater than this means, okay, this just means if scalar curvature is, have this lower bound, then chi is very close to one. Okay, then the, then the theorem tell, the following, this is, we have the following result that the product of the two numbers cannot be made arbitrarily small. They always have a lower bound. I prefer to call this an uncertainty principle because, well, let's think about it geometrically. If P is small, means the Fourier transform of, of chi is very, very concentrated near zero. And when S is small, means the function chi is also very, very concentrated near zero, like the, the picture of this. Uh, but from the spirit of Fourier transform, we know that this cannot happen. It's impossible that the function as well as the Fourier transform is, are both very concentrated near zero. Uh, okay, but uh, actually that's just spirit, but it's not a rigorous proof. We actually, the previous argument already gave a proof. If this number can be made arbitrarily small, then the previous C can be made arbitrarily small, which will lead to a contradiction. But actually, I, I, I don't know if this is a more like analytic elementary proof for that. Okay, I think it would be an interesting question for maybe undergraduate students to ask if they can prove this inequality. You only use elementary uh, analysis. Okay, so now actually to find the best of constant, constant C in previous page is to find the best constant or to find the lower bound of it. Okay. So back to the picture here. Uh, actually, the picture is, is, is a little bit misleading because I always draw a picture like chi is strictly increasing. But actually, we don't have to do that. I don't have to assume that. We have two small numbers. We assume we can allow that the function is slightly greater than one. But it's a good starting point to think about an easier case when we add an extra constraint chi prime policy. So chi is strictly increasing. Then in this case, one can actually compute the lower bound very, very explicitly. And the function that obtain the lower bound is given by the Slapian function, uh, which is a very classical paper of Slapian in the 1980s. So uh, classically, the Slapian function are the eigenfunctions of a given uh, integral operator. But here, we only use the eigenfunction correspond to the maximal eigenvalue. Okay, I don't want to really move to more on this uh, definition for this, but I, I want to show you a picture. So here we chose if epsilon one, the, the lower bound to be 0 0.03. Okay, I, I don't want to explain why it is, but just 
some numbers used in the in the estimate. Okay. And in this picture, p chi is equal to two. So if you square root it, it's actually supported from negative one to one, right? Because uh, if you come, if you square it back to chi means convolution in the Fourier transform, which will enlarge the support. And in this case, under the assumption, one can actually exist it, compute it numerically. And this is like 2.86. So the number C is twice of this, which is like 5.73. And the picture of chi looks like this. And uh, the slapping function, the Fourier transform of a square of its derivative, square root of the derivative is like this. Okay, so under such constraint, the function is, is actually very explicit and very well studied. But in general, as you can imagine, uh, if, we, if we release the constraint, the constant can be made better or smaller. Oh, oh, oh by the way, I forgot to say, uh, I only have say epsilon one because here we don't have, don't need the epsilon two. Epsilon two is the upper bound, but here the upper bound is always one. But in general, we, we do have to use both. But to be honest, from the general case, we, we uh, I have no idea how to really find a, we have no idea how to really find a solution to that, but we can use some numerical task to, to approximate, at least we believe that we are approximate, we are almost there. So here's an example. Uh, when epsilon one is still the same number as the previous page, epsilon two is slightly larger. And, and here we still assume p chi is two. And, and we obtain that s chi in, for this chi is equal to 1.355. Okay, smaller than the previous page, which is 2.8, okay. And in this picture, the chi prime over two looks like this. And chi, it's a, uh, well, it's still normalizing function, but as you can see, it's not really increasing. It has some wave near one. Okay, here, uh, but anyway, because we lose the constraints, we get a better constant. Okay, but in general, uh, because this is just numerical result, but in general, it's still interesting to ask uh, what is the best kind of how do we find it? If there's a more analytic expression for that. Okay, all right, so um, any questions so far? Okay, now, uh, now that's every, now so far everything results work for closed manifold, but the interesting thing is that we can generalize to non-compact complete manifold. So the, the key idea to, for the generalization, okay, is the following. So oh, let, me, let me first recall, for closed manifold, the result looks like square root sigma, let's say equal to C times Lipschitz of P, okay? But for non-compact manifold, when we talk about pairing between key theory and key homology, the key theory is actually not a projection on the manifold, it's a projection on, well, say one point compact, compact identification. Or from the operator level, we only talk about the projection of, of the C0 of X. Or you can even move to CC of X. So now the, to, to compute the lower bound of the operator, uh, actually, one do not need to care about the scalar coefficient outside the outside the support, because away from support, the function is zero, so there's nothing to worry about. So one only need to ever worry about the scalar curvature near the support of the function in C zero of x. So here, originally we have square root sigma, but now the, this term can be made to be the scalar curvature only on the support. Or near the support, and the result is falling. So, uh, so here we need two different parameters. One is the Lipschitz constant, another is where there is support. Okay, so now we are working on even dimensional complete spin manifold, and we fix a point and fix the projection in k zero. And if p is Lipschitz and compactly supported. Oh, well, uh, here I should say I cheated a little bit because uh, there's no compactly supported projections. But to really, I don't want to my projection means outside this, the function is constant. 
or if it's really a projection, it should be the difference of one projection and a constant projection. Well, okay, but there's actually uh, no technical difficulty to, to think about the difference. So I, you, you can just pretend that this is a complex supported projection, okay. All right, and furthermore, we have non-zero index pairing. Then we have the similar formula, like the closed case, it's a follow. So this is square root of the scalar curvature lower bound, but only for x on the ball near the support. So r plus slightly larger than c1 over l. And this is less than or equal to c2 times l. Where the constant c1 and c2 are universal and only, only actually only depends on the normalizing function you choose. Okay, so this is this theorem provides a quantitative relation between the index pairing and scalar curvature. So not only we can say it's zero or non-zero, but we can also say well how how, how large it is using some like uh, quantities from the projection. Okay, so here's the, this is actually the main result I want to talk about because it was not only about close, but also for non-compact medicine. Okay, um, okay, and um, after this, I will say some applications for the theorem. The first one is called the uh, bandwidth inequality. So this, uh, this is a, well, a uh, conjecture or the question raised by Gromov in 2018. And he, he proved in the original uh, statement and in some special cases, Okay, so the statement is as follows. So X is an n-dimensional closed beam manifold with non-zero a heterogeneous. If there's a metric on the band here, here's this band, X cross uh, interval, and it has two boundaries, X times negative one and X times one. Okay, on X, because a hat genus non zero, there's no positive scalar curvature metric. But on the band, it is possible to have positive scalar curvature metric. But if there is one, the band cannot be too wide. The width has a lower bound. The distance of the two boundaries is less than or equal to Cn over square root of sigma, where Cn is a constant only depends on n. Okay, um, here I just say a hat genius, but actually this condition can be made even more general. Like you can consider the covering space of the higher index value in some group system adverb that I don't want to turn into that too much, but just say a hat genius as an example. And uh, this, or, or the, even the higher index version is proved by Zucchini and Zyla with Cn is equal to two pi times square root n minus one over n which actually turns out to be the best constant. And alternatively, there's another proof by Guo and Xie and Yu uh, use a quantitative vanishing theorem of higher index. Okay, and um, here, but, but in that, this paper, uh, the constant they have obtained is actually uh, slightly far away from the best constant, but still a proof in a different point of view. But here, I would like to uh, tell you how to understand theorem throughout the index pairing. It's actually of similar spirit of the paper of Guo Xian Yu, but in a slightly different language. So spirit is follows. So first, we start from the band. This is x cross the interval. And we extend the metric from the band to a real line. Okay, this is x cross r. And now we can cons consider the index pairing for the, on this non-compact manifold. The operator we're talking about is still the Dirac operator, D, on this large manifold. And the, the projection, or maybe not, well, actually, in this case, not projection, it's a K1 class we're using. It's uh, uh, the bot element on real line. So this is actually uh, lies in K1 of R. Well, actually the previous theory 
uh, can be either generated from K0 to K1. Things are just parallel. And for K1 of R, the generator, so because this is a one-point compact compactification, so you can just think about to be K1 of S1, which is generated by uh, unitary, uh, classified by one in numbers. In particular, uh, the operator with one in number one is this function. Okay, this is um, uh, okay, it's just like the normalized function. It's a function on R from negative one to one, and e to the two pi i of this gives you a non trivial K1 class. And furthermore, this K1 class paired with D, it gives you, it's equal to the A hat genus of X, which can be understood like, like, a, like a family index, uh, like, like family program index theorem. And anyway, it's, it's still non zero. Okay, but the point is here, we can, we can choose a function to be constant outside the band, but only vary from negative one to one inside the band. But if the band is too wide, you can think about the picture, if it's getting wider and wider and wider and wider, then the function can be made arbitrarily flat. Or in other words, Lipschitz constant can be made arbitrarily small. So back to the theorem, if we can make L very small, but here uh, the support of the the support of the class is only on the band, so this is greater than or equal to sigma greater than zero. Okay, then if L is very very small, this will lead to a contradiction. Okay, this is our one application for the bandwidth inequality. So there's actually uh, some, there's really some other flavors of uh, conjectures raised by Gromov. So I think originally people only think about like, does the manifold exist or non exist scale curvature, positive scale curvature? But actually recently there really comes some new idea from Gromov that if the manifold have positive scale curvature, then how do we tell the geometry of it? So this is one of the big questions. So if the positive scale curvature band, then the geometry is that, okay, it cannot be too wide. There are lots of similar questions raised by Gromov in such a flavor. Okay, and uh, I want to say a uh, second application is about decay of scalar curvature. So uh, let me back to this theorem first. If we can, find, okay, if we fix the class of P, you know, in the same class, there are like infinite many representatives, but we can, but we can within the, rep, if we are possible to re, within the representative and make the L smaller, and R can be, as usually getting larger and larger. And L is smaller, R is larger, you can think about this formula as a decay of scalar curvature. The inf of scalar curvature on a ball with one of the radius getting larger and larger, it gets smaller and smaller. And the decay rate is related to the function between L and R. So this gives us the following theorem. If we're working on a complete, uh, uniformly contractible manifold with finite symptotic dimension. Uh, here, I would like to uh, speak too much for the uh, matrix, matrix space theory for the definition of this concept, just to say, okay, um, these are some assumption on the geometry and very coarse assumption on the geometry or the metric on the manifold. And if we assume this, the two technical assumptions, then the scalar curvature on the ball of radius R has an upper bound. Uh, the inf of the scalar curve has an upper bound with one over f of R. Well, where f only depends on the data from the uniform contractible and the simple finite simple dimension. So in other words, if we assume these two assumptions and we know a little bit about the manifold of the, about this metric, and then we can see the decay of scalar curvature. So let me draw, maybe draw a picture. So it's a larger R and R, and the scalar curvature is getting uh, smaller and smaller, but it cannot, be, uh, it cannot be too large. 
we cannot have like a uh, scalar equation. It's all, it, it possible to go to zero, but almost one because they're very slow. This is impossible. So the, the, the I have a, a bound given by F. Here, uh, I should say F, uh, when one R go to infinity and F of R also go to infinity. Then the, and the key idea of this theorem is actually what I just stated. So suppose that we have a non-zero pairing, D and P, it's non-zero. And under such geometric assumption, a metric assumption, we can make this P more and more flat while controlling the diameter of its support. So you can think about the example in Euclidean. We can find a standard Euclidean. You can make it flat by just, just rescaling it. But up, when you do rescaling, the support is also getting larger. So in that case, R is almost one over L. Because if you rescale it and you scale by, 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 maybe by two, and support it also expand by two, right? That, so this is, this is a relation also. So, so actually in this theorem we also have such a function a relation between R and L just like this, but not a, just a simple uh, one over L function, but probably contains a F. Okay, probably, um, let me show you some examples of this uh, application of the decay theorem. So here's a very concrete example, and I think uh, we can give this to promise to to undergraduate students. So if you think about the paraboloid of revolution, z is equal to x squared plus y squared, and we can compute the scalar curvature or the Gaussian curvature. Well, I really know how to do it, but the Gaussian curvature is actually positive, but go to zero as the point go to infinity. And in particular, okay, it decays quadratically with respect to the intrinsic metric. Here, the intrinsic, okay, we, we start from the origin point zero, zero, zero here, and for the point x, y, z, the intrinsic metric from x, y to zero is, is, is almost z, or x squared, plus, x squared plus y squared. So the denominator is about almost the intrinsic metric and then squared, so this is what I mean by quadratic decay. So actually, uh, it's proved, proved by Gromov and Zeller showing that if X is a uniformly contractible complete surface with dimension at least two, uh, at, at most two, then the scale curvature is like quadratic decay. So A on the ball, A is most one over R squared. Okay, but uh, you might say, wow, look at your Theorem, you're thinking that it's one over f r. Does it is f have to be a quadratic function? Well, probably it's true for two. It's true for two dimensional, but in general, it's not true. Actually, if you move one dimensional higher, if you go to a three dimensional manifold, there will be an example, uh, which actually in your theorem we can deal with. So it's uniform contractible and also finding a simple dimension, and for any given a decay function, the scalar curvature decays slower than it. I mean, oh, sorry. I mean, you, if, if you're given a function, there's just a, there is a three dimensional manifold. Okay, this, part, this said that the, at least the dream of a quadratic decay is wrong in general, but there always have to be a function control the, the relation of scalar curvature and uh, the distance. And actually, in this case, our the function we're given of f is somehow the best up to a constant return. Okay, so this is uh, this is the last slide, and I want to say the application of the theorem on non compact manifold and given by index pairing. Okay, um, oh, it's almost time. I, I think I will just stop here, and the episode will top out today. And thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, Jimmy. Are there any questions or comments?
uh, maybe I, I ask one naive question. So both concepts exist in the non-commutative case. I mean, scalar curvature, now we have a good idea of what the scalar curvature is in the non-commutative case. And torus also, yeah, we have, and torus. theory also exists. Yeah. So maybe one should think about the corresponding things, principles, you know, conjectures in, in the case of non-commutative tori, I mean. Yeah, right, key, key homology and key theory all, also make sense. That's right, yeah. Yeah, but but there's one, but there's still, I, I know there's still differential operator on, on non-commutative tori, but yeah. I'm not 100 sure if there's a leach noise formula. Uh, uh, I have to think, I think there is, I mean, um, but I have to think that's a good point. Yeah, but that's, uh, yeah, that's something, yeah, to think about, yeah. Yeah, that's a very natural question. Yeah. Very good point. But it's in the non-commutative setting, even the very definition of scalar curvature took some effort. Yes. Um, I would say computing it took more effort than defining it, <laughs> yes. Okay. And yeah. so if there is a natural Dirac operator in that setting, which encodes scalar curvature, it would be really interesting. Uh, Yes, uh, so so far I think has been done for conformal perturbations of flat metric, basically. Okay. Calculations has been done mostly for that. If you do more general, I mean, um, it's, it becomes very, very complicated. Uh, calculations become extremely complicated. But, mm -hmm. but so your result for conformally, I mean, Perhaps for conformally flat metrics are easy. I mean, mm, yeah. If if if, if like uh, at least if Lipschitz is equivalent, then the result can be made better. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 I think one should in the non-commutative case one should focus first on conformally flat case. Yeah. Mm. But, uh, yeah. Well, thank you for your talk. It was very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Any other question or comment for Jimmy? Well, if not, let's thank Jimmy again and uh, for a very nice talk. Okay.